Hello, folks. It is World War II TV, and it is a continuation of our attrition and Beyond the Beach week. And we are back in the Canadian sector. I hope you watched the show um, with Mark the other day about Oti and Buron. That was really good. And I hope you've gone back and watched last year's show with tonight's guest, Mike Bechtold, about the events of June the 8th. But now we are talking about the events of 77 years ago today, June the 11th, between the villages of norion bessin and Le Manil Patry. So, Without further ado, here's our team. So our historian in Canada, uh, Dr. Mike Bechtold. Good evening, Mike, or good afternoon for you. Thanks, Paul. Happy to be here. And, of course, on ground is, is Mag. So Mag is in Norion Bessin with the bells going at the moment, Mag. Can you hear me, Mag? Yes, I can hear you. Hello, everybody. And Enjoy so the this show. is the village of Norion Bessin. And um, well, I just lost Mike temporarily. Um, I hope you'll come. Oh, there we go. Back in again. So there we are. So um, we have been talking about these events of 77 years ago. And um, it was, as you'll find out, folks, a, a not particularly good day for the Canadian Army in Normandy. But that's the whole point of what we're trying to cover this week is after the initial success of June the 6th, there was a, a jostling for positions as both armies moved up their reinforcements, trying to occupy the same areas. And some way, days went well for the Allies and some days didn't go so well. Um, so, Mike, um, let's start. You've, we've got an incredible array of um, images and aerial photos, thanks to yourself and thanks to our pre-work in advance. But let's set the scene with um, what was happening um, with the uh, 7th Brigade Fortress. It kind of gives us an idea about where the Canadians were at the beginning of play on June 11th, 77 years ago. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Paul. Really uh, happy to be here and, and chatting with everybody out there. Uh, whether you're in, in Canada or England or France or wherever you might be. So welcome, everyone. Today was a, a tough day for the Canadian Army in, in Normandy. Um, the attack on Le Manil Petri was the, the worst day of the war for the first Hussars. Um, maybe not the worst for the, the Queen's Own Rifles, but if it wasn't the worst day, it was pretty close to the worst day. And uh, it was just a really tough, unfortunate situation. But I think to understand what's going on here today, we need to talk a little bit about what was going on with the, with the Canadians in, in general up until this. So this is uh, five days into the, uh, the the battle in Normandy. They landed on the 6th of June, obviously. Um, the 7th of June was a, a tough day for uh, the 9th Brigade when they had that battle with uh, uh, 12th SS Division that uh, Mark Milner talked about so brilliantly um, on uh, Paul's show a few days ago. Um, but then the uh, the tables turned and there was the uh, the, the great battles around uh, Nori, Brettville and Puto from the, the 7th to the 10th of June, where 12th SS was trying to attack over and over and over again and, and uh, continuously got bludgeoned back. They had a, a small local success on the 8th of June when they uh, kind of pushed the Winnipegs out of uh, uh, Puto en Besson. But uh, by the end of the day, a, a counterattack by the uh, Canadian Scottish and the first desires had, had recaptured the town and, and the Germans would never get that far north again. Um, the German 12th SS then turned their attention to the, uh, the, the Regina rifles in, in Breadville and Norrie. And over the course of two, two and a half days, they uh, attacked four times. And each time they were pushed back often with very heavy losses and were never able to accomplish what they wanted. And that brings us up to uh, the 11th, when it's the Canadians' turn to go on the offensive again. And uh, just like the Germans were experiencing, offensive operations in Normandy are not easy. And uh, the Canadian uh, experience was such that uh, they hadn't done a lot of planning. They hadn't tied in all of their advantages, all of the... Uh, uh, artillery they had at their resources. They tried to launch a uh, an impromptu attack uh, without enough reconnaissance on Lumino Petri, and uh, it didn't go so well. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Yeah, and just to remind you, folks, Maggie is starting in Norion Bessin. So um, this is the, the village to the um, uh, to the start line. We're just on the map there, and Mag is going to show us the image. And we'll do a match up our first then and now. So um, Mag, if you can kind of face. That's it, down the street there. So see, folks, those two buildings right in the middle of the shot there. There's a shadow cast over the side of a building there. Well, that is the same look we're looking at in this view here, which is a German half track artillery bombardments as well. But that is exactly where we are. So there's buildings there in the background. See them there, square top, that bit there. That's exactly where Mag is there in front of the church. And then Mag will go and show us the first uh, Hussars monument, which other unit Mike will be talking about. So, yeah. 
There's the Orion Best Sand Church was heavily um, heavily damaged in the fighting, and it's a great place to go and start and explore this battlefield from because you've got some nice um, memorials there to see. And Mike will address this later on, but the, uh, the the locals in this area of Normandy are very, very pro-Canadian, pro-Allied, pro the interest in the battle. There's a church being rebuilt after all. Again, fantastic camera work, Mag. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can uh, we can see the uh, the old steeple from that church. I wonder if Meg can pan up and look at the uh, the church steeple as it looks today. Yeah, if you can go show us the top of the church, Mag, the steeple, please. There she goes. She's very obedient today. And Colin is doing the there we are. And it's it's missing its very top spire bit. They they didn't replace that after the war. Yeah, so it's it's squared off, and uh, in some ways, it's the uh, the best thing for when you're on the battlefield here because you can look around and. Uh, it's a very distinctive uh, profile. Most uh, churches have that uh, defined steeple that goes to a point, and this one is squared off. So when you see that, you know exactly uh, where it is and, and where you're looking. Yeah, and and you can see, if you, I'll put the photo back. If you can show the ground level again, Mag, and show the war monument, the First World War, what I mean, and then I'll show the photos we have um, taken in June 44. So they've moved things around a bit. They've moved... Even in fact, even the first Uzars monument has probably moved since the last time Mike was there because it was the other side of the road opposite the church before, but it moved it beside mm -hmm. the church. But there's that very distinctive French First World War statue there, and I'll throw up the image again. You can see it there in a the photo there. So there's a statue, and there's a pre-war photo of the church, and that's a, a Dame Dingo in that photo there. Then the, the previous one, we have a Morris Light Reconnaissance car, which is a, one of my favorite vehicles from World War II. Um, and you can see that same statue there. So that's to, just to show where we are. People love seeing the then and now photos, but this is kind of as a bonus for what we're talking about today. But while we're starting there, it'd be silly not to show these photos. But what we really want to show you is um, is these incredible graphics Mike has prepared us about kind of the state of play um, on the beginning of June the 11th. And this is a wonderful com uh, composite aerial photo there. And Mike's got a book coming out in June. It's June, isn't it, Mike? We'll try. Uh, keep our fingers crossed. There's still a long way to go, but that's the plan. And Atlas of the Normandy campaign with some of these photos, things like that inside it. So that'll be one of those indispensable books I think we'll all need. But if you wanted to see, briefly explain what we're seeing in that aerial photo there, Mike, I mean, basically that's the line of German defenders. And Mag is here in Norion Bessan, and there's our objective, Le Manil Apache. But this, I guess, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to speak first, is that these, the authors have kind of tried these attacks, and I kind of, I guess they kind of realized that isn't working very well for them, so they've gone a bit defensive now. Is that basically the, the, the situation? Yeah, and uh, really the fact that the Germans have gone defensive um, speaks to the success of the Canadians over the uh, the previous five days, and, and including what we're talking about today, because... Uh, what uh, what we're talking about is uh, clearly a, a tactical defeat for the Canadians on the 11th of June. But uh, what I want to talk a bit about is how that uh, even if it was a, a tactical defeat for the Canadians, it really was a an operational victory for the Allies. And I'll, I'll explain that in, in more detail as we go on. But uh, the, the Germans' main plan at this point, as, as Mark Milner talked about so brilliantly uh, on his talk on the 7th, was that the Germans were looking to counterattack. They were looking to launch a core level counterattack uh, spearheaded by three uh, armored divisions, 12th SS, 21st Panzer and, and Panzer Lair Division that would uh, be what they hoped would be the, the penultimate attack that pushed the Allies out of Normandy back into the channel and uh, sort of won the battle for them. But to do that, they needed good tactical ground. So the attacks by 12th SS in particular on the uh, uh, 7th to the 10th against the 7th Brigade Fortress were not that big massive counterattack they were planning, but it was a counterattack meant to establish the, the start line for that core level operation. So they wanted to uh, capture that ground the Canadians were sitting on that would allow them to bring up their, their three uh, Panzer divisions, put them in line, and then send them in what they hoped would be that uh, successful major counterattack that, that ended the battle. Um, but they were never able to uh, to capture that. And so over this period, going from about the, the 8th, 9th, 10th, right through the 11th, 12th, and I'm not sure when they finally gave up on it, but it was not too long after this, um, they realized that they weren't going to be able to uh, achieve the superiority, the uh, the overwhelming force they needed to uh, to allow them to uh, to launch that counterattack. And, and a lot of what uh, the reasons behind that are, are going to be what we're talking about here today. 
And so Maggie's just showing us the first Hussars and the Regina Rifles. Regina Rifles won't really come into our talk today, only kind of in passing, but they are the ones who are counted as the liberators of Nori and Bassam. But the first Hussars are absolutely integral to the story. That's who we'll mostly be talking about today with the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada. So that's, that's shown us where we are. So now let's talk about the Canadian side of things, because there, there was a first plan and then a revised plan actually happened, which was which complicates matters. And it's very, very effectively shown here on your aerial photo. So this was um, the proposed Canadian plan. And, and to put it into context, this is all to do with gaining high ground. It's to do with the Villa Bocage offensive that we're going to have in a couple of days' time, high ground of Cristo. It's all to do with, ultimately with the taking of Caen. But we're not going to go into too much detail about that because I think it will just kind of dilute what we're talking about today, which is a you know a single action for a single village. But it's all about expanding the bridge, the bridgehead. Yeah, and, and it's important to keep everything in context here because the Canadian attack on Luminal Petri is often looked at as a individual Canadian action. But of course, the Canadians weren't by themselves. They weren't acting on their own. Um, the idea was that this was supposed to be a uh, an attack made in concert with the 5th British Division that were further to the, the Canadians' right, further to the west, that were um, exploiting south as well. And uh, they were trying to uh, essentially outflank Khan. So they wanted to attack down south through the the, the Sul River Valley, um, trying to sort of break through the German defensive line and ultimately outflank and, and capture Khan from the south. So the British were attacking south down there. I believe it was 8th. Uh, 8th British Armoured Brigade that was attacking that way. And uh, in fact, on the uh, the 11th, there were uh, two British battalions. The um, Which ones were they? Um, two battalions, um, the, the Green Howards, I think. Green seven, Howard, yeah. 7th and 8th Green Howards were attacking. And they were sort of attacking just to the west, just off this map here. So the original Canadian plan was that they were supposed to go in on the 12th of June. So um the next day but for reasons that uh, aren't clear the british high command ordered the canadians to go in on the uh, the 11th so instead of having uh 24 to 36 hours to plan this attack they were notified at about 7 30 or 8 o'clock in the morning that their attack was to go in um that day and uh, they didn't go in even as early as the british wanted they ended up pushing it to a, a two o'clock start time 1400 hours it eventually became about 14 30 but uh, they were sort of going through this whole planning process for the attack in really, really short order. And uh, you have to remember that uh, the, the Canadians are, are well-trained. They've been preparing for this for a long time, but they were still green. They were still uh, learning how to actually sort themselves out in battle, um, how to deal with it, how to do the, the planning process, how to link together the various arms because of an attack like this is obviously using uh, armored units. It's using infantry units. Um, they need uh, artillery support, there's engineers, there's anti-tank units, bringing all these forces together. So it's a really tough thing to do in the short amount of time they were given to do it. And as it turned out, that wasn't enough time. They really didn't uh, understand what was going on. They didn't do the reconnaissance they needed. They didn't understand where the Germans were. And they didn't even understand where uh, the their own Canadian forces had deployed. So that um, initial plan that we see, uh, that we just saw in the air photo there, um, the idea was um, that uh, uh, the first Hussars were supposed to come down from their um, uh, location in, in Bray, which is just north of the map where they were in harbor or in, in Leaguer, Lager, however you want to say that. And uh, they were supposed to come down uh, past Brettville, uh, turn right uh, to the west, go sort of through that area of the Cardinville farm, and then uh, use that railway line, the, the Combea railway line, as their start line. And I just show one arrow there, but really they were supposed to sort out and have uh, a number of squadron attacks going down into um, uh, Luminel Petri doing that. But as they came down through, they talked to the Regina Rifles and discovered that the Reginas had planted a number of minefields um, on either side of that uh, Brettville Nori Road. Um, they weren't clear exactly where those minefields were. So as a result, they couldn't make that right turn and they had to keep going south into uh, Nori itself. And you can show us the uh, the next slide, Paul. And uh, so instead of attacking sort of due north from uh, sort of the Brettville, Nori, uh, sorry, Combe uh, railway line and going right at Luminal Petri, they had to go down into Nori. Um, it means their attack is on a single axis. Um, in fact, a single tank axis because it's a, a narrow road. It's uh, heavily rubbled by the fighting. They have to make a, a hard right turn at the church 
And uh, in fact, some of the tanks have to slow down and kind of wiggle their way around to, to make that turn. And then they get to the edge of, of Nori, that western edge where you see that little break in the, the line where they sort of do a half left turn. And that's where they sort themselves out. So instead of uh, attacking to do north, they're attacking from the east. It's a, a 90 degree change to their axis. Um, they're attacking on a, a narrow frontage instead of a wide frontage. And uh, it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. I'm just going to jump in and tell people where we're going to be today. So there's a, a modern Google Earth image there. So Mag has just left Nori on Ben San and Ben San and Colin is driving down this way and they are moving their way towards the middle patch. And where they're going to go is they're going to go up this track here to electrical relay uh, uh, place so they can sit literally in the middle of the battlefield and pan around. So when Mike starts explaining the next bit, we can see all the way around 180 degrees around the battlefield there and get an idea of this ground because, um, it's all about the ground. When you're doing a battlefield tour, it's all about the ground. And the difference is between what we're doing and if you actually were there with a bus group or a tour group, we can be in two or three places at the same time in the sense that I've already got some pre-footage I can show from other locations so we can give you a really good idea of what it was like. And I want to emphasize the fact it is 77 years ago. The crops would be very similar, three foot of wheat in the fields there with the similar kind of temperatures, the similar um, foliage on the hedgerows. You know, with this, this is how it would have been. Um, and so it's good to get out there on the ground and see it at the time. So, um, Matt, they're not on their way there. So that's where we're going to be. And uh, that's what we're doing. This, by the way, I found it today in my research that is a, is a map by a 12th SS map that came up on an auction a couple of years ago. And this is the Manil Patry here. And this is Norion Bessen. It's showing some of the uh, uh, Panzer uh, positions here south of the village of the middle patch and south of Norian and Bissau. I just thought I'd throw that in as an extra there. Um, I think they're now there. I think they're now at the location. So this is where they're going to be. I've called it there from the center of the battlefield. And it's beautiful sunshine there. So I'll put it on Mag's feed and then kind of let Mike, Mike carry on talking, essentially, with these glorious images we've got. Yeah, so th this really is the key spot on the battlefield. It's uh, it's interesting as you kind of try to reconstruct the battle and understand what happens. The uh, uh, positions for 12 SS that I have on that air photograph that I've marked on, I've taken from the uh, the wonderful uh, account of the battle written by uh, Michael McNorgan in the uh, First Desires Regimental History. And and he's got them lined up like that. And he's got uh, B Squadron, which was the lead First Desires Squadron, sort of going just south of that road between uh, Nori and uh, Luminel Petri. And then later on, C Squadrons comes just to the north. If you look at the uh, the Hubert Meyer book on uh, 12th SS, and uh, in particular, he's got a, a good map of the battle. He shows the main battlefield as being right here where uh, where Mag is right now, um, that the main attack and the main German defensive line was actually not in front of uh, Luminel Petri, but rather um, sort of in that gap between the two villages, and that's where the Canadian attack came. So here we are 77 years on, and, and there's a difference of opinion in, in where the battle happened, how it took place. Um, I suspect the, the truth is somewhere in between, um, but I think a lot of the fighting was taking place in that open field between the two villages, as opposed to uh, in the, the, the village itself. Yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, me and Colin were out there doing a recce, then I went back with Mag, Mag doing a second recce, is that you are on a slightly elevated ridge in the middle of those two villages. I mean, it's not very much. You would barely even come up as contour lines on a map, but there is, from Norion Bessan to Luminil Patchy, this bit here is about the highest spot. And crucially, if you're in each village, you can't quite see across the lower level of each village because of the rise in the middle. So on where Mag is now, you're kind of skylined a bit. And especially when, when Mike gets into it later on, we're talking Sherman tanks. We're talking infantry riding the Sherman tanks. They're going to be seen a long way off by the Germans. And then the Canadians back in Norian Bessan aren't necessarily going to see where the fire is coming from and the difficulties that that brings about. But I'm going to put it back on Mag's image now because you don't want to see my face and Mike's face. You want to see Mag's glorious images of the field. So that's looking towards Norian Bessan. So if you can kind of focus in the middle there on the church tower, as Mike said, the distinctive church tower with that without the spire means it's it's very square. It's right in the middle of the shot there, and the electricity pylons. And if you swing round 180, Mag, and show us Manil Patry, so you can see the church tower there, folks. The swing is all the way around. And there's the track. And there is the Manil Patry itself over there where that big tree line is. So that's where we're going. So this is a bit of high ground in the middle. Then I'll let Mark, uh, Mike continue talking. 
Yeah, so these these um, images are absolutely fantastic because uh, it's one thing to look at an air photograph. It's another thing to look at a map. But when you're actually uh, standing on the ground or for us, the next best thing to it, have somebody there who's filming it for us, um, we can get a, a better sense of, of the distances involved. And um, 12th SS, it was the uh, second battalion of 26 Panzer Grenadier Regiment that was uh, holding this piece of ground. Most of their infantry was out in front of the town, dug in in these fields, and they were in uh, slit trenches and, and really quite invisible to the, the tanks as they uh, made their attack. Um, but also important to note is that they had a line of anti-tank guns that were back on the edge of the village um, that would have been ideally positioned to uh, to start attriting the Canadians as they came over that slight ridge as they uh, started to make their move. So that was a, a big problem for the Canadians. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the uh, the tactical formation that um, the Canadian battle group took for this attack. And uh, in, instead of uh, being sort of infantry walking alongside the tanks or, or leading the way, the uh, Queen's Own were actually riding on the backs of the Shermans. And that's a really telling uh, feature for me in trying to understand uh, what happened with this battle, because uh, to me that says that the Canadians really didn't expect there to be a fight at this point in the battle. They mm. expected to be able to move on to their objective, objective, have the infantry debus and sort of take, uh, take control of it. Um, because you're not going to go into a battle, you're not going to attack a prepared defensive line with infantry riding on the backs of your tanks. That's just not what anybody would have done. And uh, it, it shows partly the um, uh, the limited intelligence the, uh, the Canadians had, that they didn't understand where the Germans are. They didn't understand they were going to make a stand here. Um, the Canadians' final objective was actually, uh, uh, Le Manil Petrie was uh, an interim objective. Um, they were just supposed to occupy it as a sort of a, a firm base and then exploit further due south to the area of um, uh, Chaux and uh, there's a, uh, where the 26 Panzer Grenadier Regiment um, headquarters was, and I forget the name of the village right now, which is just sort of south of Chaux. And uh, so really they were thinking they were just going to occupy Le Manil Petrie and then the next bound would be uh, the more... Uh, tactical bound where uh, they might experience fighting. So they were surprised that the Germans were occupying it. They were surprised the Germans were holding it. Um, and that's that's not right. They should have had that intelligence. They should have been able to talk to the uh, Canadian Scottish who were in Puteaux that would have had an idea of that, or the Reginas that were in Nori and Brettville that should have been able to tell them that. But they didn't because this attack was... Uh, uh, carried out too quickly. Everybody didn't talk to each other who uh, was supposed to be talking. And the other big part that uh, wasn't done was that the artillery wasn't uh, tied into this operation in any way, shape, or form. Um, even though we've got uh, four, five uh, regiments of uh, 25 pounders that are within range, um, other batteries of medium guns and heavies, and this is just on the edge of the range of uh, naval gunfire support, None of this was there, and it would have made all the difference because uh, if you uh, mount an attack where you've got uh, a barrage to lean into, um, it's going to cause big problems. And especially when the uh, the Germans counterattack and come out of their uh, defensive positions, that's when you can kill the enemy. That's when artillery yeah. can be really effective. But we didn't have it there, and uh, that was a big handicap for, for the Canadians. So I just want to give a bit of an idea of the German field of fire. So I'm going to throw that um, that German map up again now, but I've enlarged it. So so Mag is over here somewhere in the middle. But look at the the uh, the, the where the Germans have marked where they are here, because I'm going to show you where they. Because this is I'm going to show you some footage I took a few days ago. This is the other footage I took. See on Mag is here by the um, by the electrical place here, just here in the in the track. She's kind of facing north and swinging around here. But see here over here where I put the from the copse. There's a little copse that wasn't there then, but it's little copse of trees there. And here's footage I took from there a few days ago, which will give you a really good idea. Um, there's the pylons that Mag was just showing you. So this is look that where those trees are in the middle, that's where Mag is. But hopefully you can now see how from where you are we are now, you can't see Norion Bessan itself. It's over that hump. It's not a big hump. I say it's not even a contour line. It's just a few meters. And then I swing round to the chateau, which will come into our story later on. And that is the Manil Patry itself there. And there's that kind of very distinctive thick hedge there. And there's the edge of the copse. This is footage I took a few days ago. You can tell that by the fact the sky is a completely different color. It's very overcast that day. But I want to give you an idea of that. If I pause it just there, see the slope coming down towards us? 
And I'm sure Mike is kind of excited seeing this footage because, you know, you've walked the ground like I have, but it's this combination of footage and aerial photos. It's really bringing it alive. And you can see there, that's the German, one of the German views that they would have had towards this, uh, these approaching Sherman tanks with guys riding on them. I think it shows you, for those who are watching this, like Alex Black and others who understand this battle, it's, it's, it's making even more sense why it ended up the way it did when you see the ground in this detail. Yeah, and, and early on the uh, early on in the battle, the the Canadians um, stumbled over the the Germans that were dug into those open fields. But uh, for them, they weren't even uh, concerned a little bit about it because for them, that's an ideal target. Infantry in the open, um, they just uh, opened up with the the coax and the and the, the hull machine guns, and uh, they talked uh, quite clearly about uh, killing uh, Germans by the the bundles because they were out in the open and they weren't a real big threat to them. But it was the the, the line of anti tank guns and then later the the German Panzers that counterattacked that uh, caused all the real problems for the battle group. So I'll put it back on Mag's image there because that's the last of my footage from a few days. The Chateau there we'll come and talk about later on. So back on Mag's image now. And then I'll move up to the map. Um, what, do we want to do the map, the map of the approach now itself? Is that the right time to do it? I guess it is. Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is uh, one of the, the great maps out of uh, McNorgan's book um, showing the sort of the second phase of the attack. And you can see what I mean by uh, he's got uh, B Squadron, which was the, the lead company um, that was uh, coming down. That was uh, Captain Harry Harrison was the officer commanding. B squadron and they had uh, embarked uh, riding on the backs D company of the, the Queen's Own Rifles under Major Neil Gordon. And uh, he's got them coming straight down that uh, that main road between the, the two villages and then moving south. Um, four of the troops and uh, the squadron headquarters deploy in the field, sort of just in front of that uh, copse that uh, Paul was just showing us from. And uh, one troop goes right into uh, uh, Luminell itself and uh, where that tank is shown right now is very close to the, the neighborhood of the where the church is today. Uh, which I believe is a rebuilt church because the original had been uh, destroyed yeah, during the war. It's a modern one, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then you can see uh, just north of where it says Wild Goose there is the, the chateau, uh, Le Chateau, which is not the uh, uh, clothing chain that uh, we had here in Canada, but it's the uh, the manor house that was occupied as the headquarters for the, the second battalion of 26 Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Um, that's where they were. And uh, he showed, uh, McNorgan's map shows... Uh, C squadron, which was the, uh, the the number two squadron in the line, uh, sort of north of that axis and going into that area. Um, so I'm not I'm not quite sure if that's um, exactly the way it played out, or if it was more the way that Hubert Meyer was showing it, where all this was taking place, sort of 45 degrees to the, the south, where uh, Marks would have been more on that road between the two villages, and uh, B Squadron would have been more deployed in the sort of that gap between the two towns. But regardless, it doesn't really make a big difference. Um, the Germans were there. Um, they uh, blunted the Canadian attack. They stopped it, and then they brought up their forces to uh, to, to counterattack it uh, in a, a significant way. So Mag is now on the main road. So I'll just show you where she is on the on the uh, the Google image again, because I think it makes sense. So I'll put the Google image up, and she is just uh, here where the Calvary is, the, the the Calvary Cross, and you got the the chateau the, or the building in front of the chateau, and the chateau there. And then there's this distinctive Y intersection of the beginning of Manila Patry. That's where I was in or filming in the copse, and that's where the the bottom arrow in, in um, and Mike's map was so about there. So there, there's the there, there's the Y intersection. There's a chateau. The cops was about here. So you can see where I was standing there was right in the middle of where well, where it is suggested some of the action took place. And we'll, we'll never know exactly where it is. Except later on, folks, we will show you knocked out Shermans in an aerial photo and show exactly where. So there are some we can actually pinpoint exactly. But that there's a chateau there. So it was completely not as uh, completely destroyed. All the outer walls for it are still there. You know, the outer kind of encircling walls and the the barns and what have you. But the building itself was um, was was damaged. So there it is after the battle, and you can see it took an incredible pounding there by both sides. I'm guessing. Yeah, for sure. And and it wasn't just on the 11th. It would have taken a pounding um, right from uh, D Day forward and uh, in the days afterwards, as this area was uh, continually shelled by both sides. And that uh, that photo is interesting. It shows the uh, the strength of the arch structure at the top. That the the roof and the walls are gone, but those uh, arch windows are, are still there, which is really quite remarkable. It is. 
And talking of quite remarkable, as in, again, Mag's footage is absolutely incredible there. And if you can you just keep circling around and showing us the ground now and showing us towards the big distinctive, distinctive kind of thick hedge to the left of Le Manil Patry as you, as, you, as you face it. So if you hold it on there, see there, there's the copse where I was for the footage you, show, you saw earlier on. So we're kind of facing right in the middle of the battlefield. And it would have been, as I say, like just like this, folks, three foot of wheat and uh, and, and open fields and, and a killing ground. And amazing footage. I'll put the map up again. Yeah, so this, this attack wasn't meant to be um, just a single axis Canadian attack. It was meant to go in concert with the, uh, the British attack that was coming further to uh, the west. But uh, a big problem with the uh, readjusted uh, axis of the Canadian attack is it moved it farther away from the British. So even though the British are attacking just the other side of uh, Brouet to the west, which is really not that far, um, you can see because of the, the nature of the train, it's that much farther um, and means that instead of being sort of a, an attack in concert, there are two separate attacks that the Germans are able to uh, deal with separately uh, without uh, uh, worrying about that at all. Uh, absolutely remarkable footage. It's uh, it's the technology we've improved since last year. It's actually the same camera. Magazine's the same phone. It's the it's the Streamyard software I'm using that's better than Zoom. Is essentially what's better now. And by the way, just at the entrance to the chateau years ago, and if you look at some of the old books about that were showing Canadians how to visit the battlefield, there was a marker there somewhere that showed where there were forty Canadians buried there after the battle. But it's it's long since been removed or taken away or lost to the mists of time but at some point there was a little marker saying there was a temporary cemetery there but i say it's no no longer there but beautiful to see that the farmers work in the fields and we do feel there's kind of a we're getting beyond the covid now and we can travel around again it's just getting really nice there but the fantastic view fantastic camera work mag and if you carry on kind of walking towards the village itself and then we can get that distinctive y intersection because that's when things start getting very detailed and tell us, Mike, by the way, while we're walking down, what's the story about the fact that Germans were intercepting Canadian radio messages? Do you believe that? Is that is that an urban myth? Um, I, I honestly don't know. Um, that's certainly a very uh, prominent uh, part of the battle, as it's discussed in Hubert Meyer's uh, 12th SS history. And uh, I, I don't see any reason to, uh, to doubt it. Um, I'm sure the Germans had good facilities for capturing those uh, transmissions, Understanding them is a different matter. Um, Meyer says, and once again, this is Hubert Meyer, not uh, Kurt Meyer. Hubert Meyer is saying that um, they had captured a, a code book um, sometime earlier in the battle after D-Day that allowed them to completely understand what the uh, the coded traffic on the, uh, the, the the radios were. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not the case. Um, I don't I don't know how much to make of that because yes, you know the Canadians are coming. But if you're not already deployed there, um, you don't have enough time to, to make a difference. So maybe it made a bit of a difference. But if you look at the rest of Meyer's account, um, you see that they are not sitting there waiting uh, to sort of ambush the Canadians, um, that the, uh, the, the tank forces that they deploy to uh, come in the battle are surprised and, and are brought into the battle, um, not because they knew it was going to take place, but because they're reacting to something that has taken place. So I, I kind of take the uh, the impact of that with a, a grain of salt. Maybe it gave them a bit of a heads up, but it wasn't the reason this battle failed. There's a lot of reasons no. the battle failed, and that's not one of them. So you can see the Google image now, folks. You can see this very thick hedgerow on the right there. Well, that's exactly the hedgerow where Mag is. So she's right here. And at the time, there was another road that kind of looped up here and went into the village from a different direction. That's no longer there, but you can still kind of see where it was by the track. But if you now pan to the left, Mag, so you can show the fields you're kind of in front of that, a bit round a bit, round to the left a bit, in front of the house. Go, kind of go in front of Colin's van a bit, really. And then kind of show that feel. If you can kind of go to that corner there where the sign is, that would be perfect if you can do that. Because I'll show you where, yeah, this is the wheat field here. Because this is where we know absolutely, because we can pinpoint them on an aerial photo where a couple, uh, th three tanks were knocked out. So I'll put the aerial photo up now. So Mag, just kind of stay around there and I'll, and I'll, um, and I'll show you the photo. So where oh, here comes the poppy shot. Yeah, here comes the, the poppy shot. 
Yeah, we'll let we'll we'll let Mag do that because otherwise, if I interrupt her, Poppy, sure, I'll get in big trouble. Superb work. So here's the area. Hold the stay around there, Mag. That's perfect. So right here we have a just after the battle aerial photo and the modern Google Earth. So you can see there where I said there was this. There used to be a road going up, looping around. So here's the old road. You can see where it went up here now. But if you look here, there's actually a third one in that photo. There's one here. A Sherman here, and there's another one. If I zoom in, there's another one, I think, here or possibly here. And these are well, Michael tell us about who the who's those were and how they got knocked out, but that's where they were. And we can match this up with some incredible photos taken um at the time. This one's the best one of all of those various tanks. And what noticeable that that one on the bottom right there is a DD, it's a Sherman DD, it's got the wading screens on it so when if you're watching the show with brad sanquart on june the 6th about the first hussars coming ashore on d-day with their dds some of these same dds are involved in this action so um i think most of us don't tend to think of dds getting off the beach we tend to think of them being a beach thing but of course you're not going to throw them away they're going to keep on using them until until they need to get replaced but that's exactly where we are those hedges in the background there that's exactly where magistan that's where this action happened and i'll let mike elaborate on the actual story behind it yeah, so those, if you can go back to those two photos again, the uh, the one in the top left corner and the one in the bottom right corner are um, showing the same two tanks from different perspectives. So uh, in the top left, that tank in the distance is that DD tank, and it's against the hedgerow. And then that's the one in the foreground that uh, Paul's pointing out right now. And those were uh, two uh, C Company tanks that were, uh, sorry, B Squadron tanks that were knocked out right at the uh, sort of the way into... Um, Luminel Patri. There's uh, there's a lot of really interesting stories. I don't know if anybody here has been to uh, London, Ontario, which is the home of the, the first Tsars, but they have a, a famous tank memorial there. Um, Holy Roller is the name of it. And it's the, I think it's the longest serving um, Sherman tank in uh, in the Canadian army for sure. It landed on D-Day. It was a D-Day DD, uh, DD tank, and it fought right through until the end of the war, which is really quite remarkable in of itself. But they saved it and brought it back, and it's been a, uh, a memorial in, in London forever. And uh, just uh, just this week, they've just uh, pulled it off the uh, the plinth in the park where it is, and it's being uh, taken and, and restored and given some uh, greatly needed uh, TLC. And uh, it will come back even better than ever. And, uh, of course, it was there on D-Day. It, it landed from the, the channel on D-Day. And it was here at this battle as well. So it's a veteran of the battle that's still around today. And it wasn't uh, one of the tanks that was right in the uh, the village battle, but it was one of the uh, supporting tanks. I think it was a squadron, but don't quote me on that. So... Um, it's uh, yeah, really quite remarkable that that is is there. But the uh, first Cesars had a really tough day. They lost uh, 37 uh, tanks during the the course of the battle, uh, which was their their heaviest um, uh, day of losses in the entire war. Um, 34 of them were 75 millimeter Shermans. Uh, three of them were Fireflies, and then they had another 13 uh, Shermans that were were damaged, but were able to be uh, recovered and and uh, put back into service after some repairs. So, uh, yeah, it's a it, it was a tough day for them. Um, and we've got a, a whole bunch of pictures that show sort of the aftermath of that, both. Uh, burnt out hulks on, on the battlefield, as well as uh, there's a couple of photos showing the, the hulks that were pulled off the battlefield and uh, were uh, sort of put into a, a tank graveyard, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure all those holes you see there were uh, taken during the battle. They were probably used for target practice after, but it gives you a, an idea of some of the, the damage that these tanks were taken. Um, and uh, it, it's totally understandable. It's not surprising to see the hits on the uh, the upper turrets, because of course, as they're coming over that rise, the uh, the anti tank guns, which would have been lower down, would have been firing up, so they would have been hitting the upper parts of the tanks. Yeah, and 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 a lot from the left as well, which makes sense given that 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 high grit, the, the bit where the Germans were to the, the south, so the the tanks are being hit on the left and the north. There was fire coming from the north. They were kind of in a maelstrom, really, but. Um, um, and the color photo, I don't know whether that's a colorized photo or whether that's, but they, they, they are German, those, those the color ones, they're German photos. Um, I have no idea whether they're real color or colorized, but um, they're quite cool. And again, you can see the DD tank there with that, with the, the detriment of war around it there. Um, and um, 
the wounded were taken back to Brentford. We'll talk about the wounded. Oh, I'm going to put it back on Mag's image again now because she's there. Uh, worth pointing out little sign in the bottom there, the committee's Juno, com uh, Juno committee. This is a, a part of the, the cooperation between the people of Normandy and the people of Canada. There's itineraries, you know, the souvenir way, the remembrance way. You, you can't miss being in the Canadian sector when you're in Normandy. There's maple leaves everywhere and there's a real sense of a, a connection maybe because some of the shared language because there were, of course, French-speaking Canadians as part of the third Canadian division. Or maybe it's just a kind of uh, uh, just a, an affection for what Canada did. I don't know, but the Lemonil Patry certainly. You know, you, when we get to the monument in a minute, you'll see that the the care they have shown for the for the Canadians and that the, the the affection they've shown for the lost. In fact, if you might as well move on to our last stop now, Mag. So thanks very much for that. I'll put the Mac the the the, the photos back up again because we we didn't kind of go into much detail about that kind of withdrawal back. So but that second map there is another stunning map from the book there, but that. Um, I'll let you. I'll let. I'll hand over to you. I'll let you explain a little bit more. Yeah, well, I just want to pick up on that point you made about the uh, the connection between uh, the French and the Canadians, and uh, I think you're uh, completely right. As a, a Canadian, I always absolutely love going to Normandy anytime, but in uh, in the summer is always great, especially around the anniversary and. Uh, anywhere you go in the uh, the Canadian uh, the areas where the Canadians fought, you will see Canadian flags uh, in front of the in front of the town hall or uh, in front of houses, and it, it's really nice to see. and And you can never forget the the Canadian uh, contribution to uh, the liberation because uh, you'll see uh, rude. Uh, uh, Regina rifles or Rue des Canadiens or, or things like that that have been named or or streets named after Canadian soldiers that either fought there or, or died there and things like that and uh, yeah I think there's a, a really really uh, amazing connection between uh, the French and, and Canadian peoples which is uh, great to see uh, it's like uh, it's almost like going home for me when I go to Normandy and uh, there's not too many places that I, I can say that and, in, and, in, and the other thing that we need to um, reference when we, it's a place like the Mill Patry is that it's mostly uh, new buildings. I mean, the village was absolutely heavily paced at the time. So there's a there's a couple of old walls and things around it. When you stand in the village centre itself, the church is pretty new. It's mostly modern buildings. So, you know, the town paid a heavy price. In addition to putting memorials up for names, they themselves buried lots of their own civilians in, the, in, in June. And, and it's now... As you drive around, as me and Colin were last week, and Mag were, you can see the villages are they're they're starting to prosper now. You can start you know development, new housing, and look at the maple leaves and things, and the Scottish and Andrews flag there as well. There's maple leaves on the uh, barn doors. I, I think it's a Quebec flag. Is it? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it is. Yeah. I just assume that being British. You now you're right. There it is, isn't it? It's Quebec flag. Yeah. Yeah. It's got the fleur de lis. And is the top one a Polish flag or is that? Or is it a folded maple leaf? I don't know. I can't. I think it was a Canadian flag. Yeah, it's a Canadian flag. Yeah, got, everything's a Canadian flag. So, yeah, Canadian. And there's a British flag there. But that's just why the building's there. That's obviously why the original ones. But Maggie's going to walk over now to the in incredible monument there, which is, I, I don't like saying it's a favourite monument when it's a list of dead, but it, it is nevertheless a monument that I appreciate because of the fact it's very personal. Sometimes... When you see like a divisional monument, it means something. But when you see a list of names, as we will very shortly, it really does should tell you just what a high price was paid for this. And yet we will, as when, when we get later into the show, Mike will explain, as he did at the beginning, that this, it may have been a, a, a terrible day for Canada. It was, a, in the grand scheme of things, it was a terrible day for 12th SS as well. They, they And I don't care because I hate them. But, uh, you know, it was it was the beginning of the end for them. They, they are, every time they engage, they, are, they can't replace the vehicles they lose out. They can't replace their manpower. So Mag is wondering, again, while we, Mag's walking, you can see the modern construction around the village now. Um, but, yeah, but that's back to the action there, the withdrawal. So Mag is... It's basically walking. She's kind of going down this bit now. She's walking down here to this intersection here where the monument is. So she's right up in the village now. Oh, she just put it on the. I didn't. I didn't catch that, Maggie. Put it back. Sorry, I didn't get it. There we are. Yeah. Udo Onsra, Thank you, Mag. Well done. Yeah. Here she goes to the monument. So we, we didn't we didn't talk about some of the people that the 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 heroes of this this um you, you sent me some wonderful images I'll put them back up there while Mag is going over there and these aren't necessarily people who died or there's some who survived but these are some of the the, the first Hussars men so um 
did you get to interview any of these guys yourself, Mike? Or you no, no, I, I, I didn't. Um, I, uh, I talked to um, uh, some resource people at the uh, First Hazars Museum uh, getting ready for this, and they were kind enough to uh, to send me those photographs and uh, a bunch of the other ones we've uh, shown during this, and they were uh, an absolute uh, fantastic resource. So thank you to them. But uh, these are, are, are some uh, people they sent me photos of. Um, did you know uh, about... Uh, the, the sergeant there, Paul. Leo, yeah, well, I, I mean, he's heavily, Leo Garapi is heavily honoured in Corsell because yeah. he came back there many times as a street named after him and a monument and an information panel now. So he's he's something of a legend in Normandy and has been for for decades. Yeah, so he he's from Quebec and uh, he was uh, with the First Hazaras for most of the war. Um, landed with them on on D Day. He was here at this battle. Um, was one of the few survivors from. Uh, B squadron that managed to uh, to get back at the end of the day, but uh, he fought through the war. After the war, he went back to Canada, and then sometime in the, I think around 1967, he uh, moved to France permanently and and lived as the uh, the town engineer in in Corsul, yeah. and uh, was there for I think about five years until he, he passed away in 1972 or, or thereabouts, and uh, he uh, he was the the man who spearheaded the, the salvage of Bold. The, the Sherman tank that is yep, the, yep. the <clears throat> monument in, in Corsoul today and, and everything like that. So yeah, he, uh, he's Canadian, he's French Canadian, but uh, he's also French and uh, had a big impact on the local community. So the name, the, these names here, I, I, it's about, I think it's 74 on one side and 82 on the other or something like that on the monument. I, I forget exactly. how I mean, this was all in one action on one day. And you know, I'll let you run through the, you run through the vehicle losses. But in terms of personnel, it was one of the most costly days in terms of it wasn't a large force committed. It was really just, you know, one company, the Queen's Own Rifles, so D Company. So they lost, was it 94 casualties or so? A lot were missing. Yeah, um, yeah. The Queen's Own took really heavy casualties. Um, one officer killed, fifty-three men killed. Um, another died of wounds. Um, Eleven POWs, and six of those were murdered. And we'll, we'll come back yeah. to that um, before we're done here. But all told, the uh, the D Company, which had about one hundred and twenty all all ranks, suffered ninety-eight casualties that day, which is absolutely devastating. Um, first is ours didn't suffer as many fatal casualties. They had 45 uh, fa fatal casualties, seven officers, six NCOs, and, and 32 men. Um, but of those, seven were uh, murdered by 12th SS. Actually, I'll put an asterisk there. At least seven were murdered by um, mm. 12th SS that we know of. And, uh, of course, the, the tank casualties that we talked about earlier. So absolutely devastating. Um, the Germans uh, suffered pretty heavily that day as well. Um, the numbers I have from Hubert Meyer, um, I, and I'm going to put a, a big asterisk beside this because yeah. this is what he admits to. I fully believe that German casualties were much higher. Um, he says that uh, the second battalion, which was the, the main defensive uh, battalion, suffered uh, only 18 killed and, and 32, 33 wounded. That uh, the SS Pioneer Battalion, which was also in Luminal Petrie in a bit of a reserve uh, position, suffered 29 killed and, and 49 wounded in action. And the uh, 2nd Battalion of 12th Panzer uh, Regiment um, suffered one killed and seven wounded. And I have a big problem with those numbers. Um, but in total, they suffered 189 total casualties, which is almost 50, uh, sorry, 25% more than total Canadian casualties. But like I said, I don't think that's the, the grand total of German no. casualties on that day. That's just what... Uh, Meyer is admitting to. He also says they only lost three tanks. Um, first is ours claimed 14 tanks. Um, and I'm sure the number wasn't 14. And I'm also sure it wasn't three. So, yeah. If Matt, can you go up and go onto the Queen's Own Rifles panel and show us the, the Westlake names, please? Because uh, someone's already noticed their names are there. Um, and this is a very famous story for those who, who uh, you live in Normandy and those who follow the Canadian history because there were three Westlake brothers. Um, two were killed in this battle. One had been killed on June the 7th. So the, the, there's their photos. They're Albert, George, and, uh, uh, and Theodore. And there they, there they are. They're three brothers, um, two killed on the same day in the same battle. And there's a Westlake brothers um, association in France that the, the particularly involved with school groups if you go to their facebook for page 
you'll find out they're always doing things. They're going to cemeteries. They do sort of um, uh, poppy wreath laying, and they do all sorts of art projects. And it's a wonderful connection between the people of Normandy and the people of Canada to honour the Westlake brothers. And there they are, two of them on the uh, on the uh, on the the monument there. So that's that worth mentioning them. Yeah, Thomas, not Theodore. I don't know why I said Theodore. Um, I yeah. also want to mention while we're there, and there, there's their graves, by the way. Re taken for this, these photos I borrowed from the Westlake Brothers Association Facebook page. So that was just taken a few days ago because they're all wearing masks. I think it might have even been June the 6th itself, and they've left the, the flags and the poppies and things there. So there's three three brothers who are not remember uh, not forgotten here in Normandy. Um and while we're back at the monument there, I mean, it's just, you can see there, absolutely beautiful monument, well kept. Uh, there's obviously wreaths been put there today because of June the 11th. And um, I also want to reference the photo, the, the, the limping back of these units because you know, tanks were pulled back. We talked about this earlier, but there's, this is Brett von Laugriers. Now, if you drive, the, if you go back and watch the show we did last June the 8th about the Panthers knocked out there, so that was June the 8th. Um, these, these were taken there, and that is the aftermath of the battle, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, it is. Yeah, those are the uh, the troops that are, are are making their way back from the battle, um, getting and back. They kindly to, gave us that Google Earth the image of them pulling their way back up there because you know what what happened. I mean, it did, obviously, it didn't it didn't work this. So without kind of spoiling the potential of future shows that we will cover the next battle, but they had to kind of limp back. What 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 was the next few days like for the Queen's Own and the First Hussars? Yeah, well, let's let's finish off the battle first because we kind of yeah, sure. got distracted. But um, um, C Squadron um, was the sort of the second squadron coming in, and they were further to the north, and uh, they they got into some problems because they started taking fire from their right flank, which uh, they initially thought was the uh, the British attack that was uh, going in at the same time. So they uh, they didn't return fire. They didn't uh, take steps to protect themselves. Um, and took some heavy losses because it turned out it wasn't the British, but it was that counterattack by the uh, um, second battalion of the 12th Panzer Regiment uh, coming into the battle, and uh, so that's uh, another problem of the communications. They're not liaising with the British. They made an assumption. It turned out to be uh, completely wrong, and uh, paid the the price for that. Um, the, uh, the the German infantry and and especially their anti tank screen had stopped the initial Canadian advance. But it was the uh, the counterattack by the the German Panzers, mostly Mark IVs, I believe, that uh, had really sort of stopped it, made the Canadians pay a, a huge price, and then sent them back. Um, the vast majority of uh, B squadrons ceased to exist on that day. Um, I think there was, and I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but there was only two or three tanks from B squadron that made it off the battlefield that day, and only one crew that was. Uh, um, sort of it wholly intact, uh, had taken no casualties. So it's uh, it was a, a tough day for sure. And we've already talked about uh, the high price paid by a D Company of the, the Queen's Own Rifles. So uh, yeah, the uh, the attack was stopped, and uh, the Canadians made their way off the battlefield. Um, I, I think it's worth spending a bit of time talking about the executions. Um, yeah, please. The uh, the the talk is called the Revenge of the Murder Division, and uh, we chose that to be particularly um, poking in the nose because the uh, the 12th SS had earned a reputation for uh, its bad behavior on the battlefield at this point. Uh, of course, there was the, the murders and the executions in uh, OT and, and Buron and at the Abbey d'Ardenne. Um, they did the same thing to uh, the, uh, the Winnipegs that were captured in the, the battles on the, uh, the 8th and 9th. Um, in fact, there was a... Um, uh, three Canadian soldiers, one from the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, uh, Private Owens, and two sappers from uh, Six Field Company, Royal Canadian Engineers, uh, Sapper INL and Sapper, Sapper Benner, that were out on the night of the 7th of June uh, planting a minefield south of Puteau, and they bumped into a, a, a patrol from 12th SS and got separated. They went on the run for the, uh, the next 72 hours, trying to find their way back to Canadian lines. They were hiding in barns and hiding in little copses of woods and, and things like that. And eventually they were uh, captured by 12th SS. They were taken back to the, uh, the headquarters of um, 26 Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which was that objective of the Canadians on this day. They were interrogated by the, uh, the brigade commander, whose name was um, uh, uh, Monke. Monk, Monk. Monka, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Monka 
flipped out on them as he was wont to do, uh, ordered them to be uh, taken off, and they were walked into the woods and executed. All three of them were killed and and uh, later found uh, shot in the back. Uh, they weren't even given a, a chance. And the uh, the battle at Le Minel Petri was just another uh, occasion where 12th SS were uh, uh, terrible, that they were acting uh, like insolent children that weren't getting their way. Uh, we know that there were at least 11 Canadians that were captured, that were disarmed, that were marched off the battlefield and were subsequently executed, um, often by may, being made to uh, lie down in a field and, and have a, a bullet put into the back of their uh, head. Uh, there was uh, three soldiers that were uh, told to, to run and uh, after they'd taken a couple steps, or there was four in this group, uh, uh, a German with a Schmeiser opened up on them, uh, killed two of them outright, wounded the other two who were then able to uh, escape and um, um, sort of get back to tell the story. Um, and of these 11, uh, these are the ones we know were murdered, that we can prove were murdered. Um, I think there was quite a few others that were uh, executed on the battlefield that were wounded or, or were captured and, and were just shot rather than anything else being done with them. So I, I think that number of uh, uh, 11 is, is quite a bit higher, uh, sorry, 13, yeah. uh, which is, is really terrible. So we talk about the revenge of the, uh, the, the murder division. Yes, they stopped the Canadians, but I think ultimately it was the Canadians that had the, the last laugh in this battle because uh, as I... Uh, indicated at the start of this lecture, the start of this talk, um, even though it was a tactical victory for the Germans, even though um, the First Hussars and Queen's Own played a, a terrible price in this battle, I think it's safe to say that ultimate victory was the Allies because what the Germans wanted to do at this point was to launch that decisive uh, campaign changing counterattack. And to do that, they needed to have their three. Uh, armored divisions, 12th SS, 21st Panzer, and Panzer Lair, um, to be able to mount a counterattack and uh, sort of take the battle to the Allies. But they were never able to do that. And it started right from the 7th of, of June when uh, Kurt Meyer had to commit his uh, 25th Panzer Grenadier Regiment to uh, counterattack the Canadians uh, on the 7th of June, which uh, at the best was a, uh, a stalemate. But again, in that battle, the, the Germans weren't able to do what they weren't wanted to do, which was launch that big counterattack. Yeah. Um, it meant that after that battle was over, 25th Panzer Grenadier Regiment was holding the line. And as long as you're holding the line, you cannot counterattack. And it's the same here in, in Le Minel Petri. 12th SS should never be a, uh, a garrison division. It should never be a division that's in the line. It is their uh, strategic uh, operational counterattack. Yeah. force. It should be behind the lines. There should be an infantry unit there. But the Germans were on the verge of defeat. Uh, they had to throw everything they had into the front window, including 12th SS. And uh, because they were holding the line, because they were being given uh, a lot of casualties, um, I think it's in uh, Meyer's book, but I'm not sure. He's saying that by this point, uh, 12th SS has lost over 25% of its tanks. Um, they've taken really heavy uh, casualties overall, and they're no longer a force that is capable of mounting this mm -hmm. counterattack. They were holding the line, and that's all they could do. And if that's all they can do, that's a defeat for the Germans, uh, pure and simple. Yeah. Um, after the battle, the uh, the survivors were told that uh, they had spoiled a, uh, a counterattack, that the Germans had been preparing to mount an imminent counterattack, and that the Canadian attack, uh, while it had failed, had also spoiled that uh, German counterattack. Um, there's no evidence that there was any imminent counterattack coming, but I think that was still a right comment that even if it wasn't imminent, that's what the Germans were trying to do. And this attack by the Canadians spoiled that and probably put it to bed forever because between the casualties that the Germans took, between the fact that they had to leave the armored division in the front lines as a, a defensive barrier meant that there was no chance that the Germans would be able to mount that counterattack. So, yes, uh, tactical Canadian defeat, but operational victory. Without and, it, and not that we're belittling the deaths of the first Hussars, but you said they weren't as bad as Queen's own rifle. The reality is, all those Sherman tanks we lost, we probably might probably replaced them within about two or three days as well. Whereas every single Panther or Mark IV we knock out of the Germans, they can't replace it. That's it. They're, it's it's one less. Now we just for your bonus stop at the end, folks, because we ended up not spending as much time as we thought. So there's a building. This is now. I'll show you where we are on the map again uh, on on a map. So just so you know where we are. So we've come back into Norion Besan. 
Um, and we've turned, they've turned up this little trap, and they're just here in Norin Basan. Now, this, oh, there's a corner of the building here where a Sherman tank coming back from the battlefield tried to go around this same narrow corner, I think, that Mike mentioned earlier, and it, and it, it didn't make it, and it was sitting there, and it was pulled out of the way sometime later and left these gouges across the wall there. So there's these kind of, if, if you come from the right, Mag, because the lights may be better. There we go. Can you see that, folks? Can you see those kind of left to down right stri scratches down that wall? Yeah, just say yes, folks. Just say it. It's humorous. <laughs> Well, that is where a Sherman tank was pulled out of that field there and kind of dragged across that wall there. And it's just one of those little bits of detail that we thought we'd show you if we got time. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's just a, a proof of the fact that this in, these events actually took place here. And you can still, if you know where to look, see scars, the battlefield on there. So that's, yeah, that's Sherman tank gouges down the side i don't know what it was do you know what it was that did it was captain i think it was george gordon was the, the the tank commander in this case but i don't know exactly which bit of the tank was dragged across there do you know yeah i don't know uh, gordon had a and if it's gordon i'm thinking about gordon had a reputation as a bit of a uh, hot rod and uh he was the guy that would put the tank into a, a skid to go around a corner and um, that's what he was doing here because it was such a, a tight turn and uh, he went too fast and skidded his tank and rolled it over. And that's how he um, yeah. uh, scraped up the wall there. Um, I just, I want to address what uh, there's some comments in, uh, in the chat right now about uh, uh, yeah, the execution too. of prisoners and, and stuff like that. And I have to say, I've got a, a big problem with that, that somehow um, explaining that Canadians and, and British and Americans executed uh, prisoners um, is equivalent to what the Germans were doing and uh, somehow excuses it or makes it understandable. I, I can't I can't say strongly enough how much I disagree with that. Uh, what 12th S was doing, 12th SS was doing was of a total different nature uh, and completely out of character, completely different from anything that the Canadians or British or American did during the war. Um, I have no doubt that um, the Canadians on occasion might not have accepted the surrender of Germans. Um, Tim Cook has written a, a brilliant article about the politics of surrender in, uh, in the First World War. And he talks about that dangerous time between uh, when a, a soldier is in the fight, when he decides he's lost the fight and throws down his weapon. And uh, you're never quite sure what's going to happen there because uh, it's the middle of a battle. Everybody's dander is up. Um, maybe you've just killed uh, the other guy's um, um, buddies and uh, it, it, it's a gray zone. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's uh, something that should be happening, but it is something that happens, but it's of a very different nature from what 12th SS was doing, which was capturing Canadians, disarming them, marching them away from the battlefield, interrogating them, and then killing them, murdering them, executing them, um, which is something that I, I've never seen any evidence that the Canadians did. That's yeah, just I mean, and we'll do we'll do a show at some point about the sh uh, what happened either at Orgia or Abbey Darden or both. And you read some of those. There's a great book, Murder at the Abbey, by Ian J. Campbell. That's hard to get now, I think, but it's worth reading. And there's George Pollard, the book. Yeah, the George, yeah. George Pollard's nephew's book, Missing. Um, the premeditated. Evil. I mean, I don't like the word evil. I think it's, it, but it, that where they're taking them out at like ten minute intervals and shooting in the back of the head, and we don't want to dwell on that now. But that is very different, as you're saying, to a guy who's just shot your friend, who throws his rifle down and throws his hands up and gets shot in that moment. There, that's that's a. It's not. It's not that we can't also say that's not perfect, but there's something different about that, and and, and more excusable. Than this absolutely premeditated, planned, and and done with almost glee. The twelfth SS. It seems to me you read those accounts; they're they're almost enjoying doing it, and that's where I think it just becomes very very different. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Sheldrake has just mentioned the uh, the case of the twelfth uh, SS ambulance in uh, OT that was uh, driving along the road and swerved purposely into a column of Canadian prisoners. Uh, killing another a, a few outright and, and grievously wounding others and yeah that kind of thing just did not happen on the allied side and it's completely different there's no there's no equivalency between um, the murders perpetrated by 12th ss and anything that was happening on the allied side 
Yeah, and it was you know we're going down a potential rabbit hole, but we were talking on Twitter a couple of weeks ago where there's two two books about the 12th SS coming out or are out so far this year, and the covers all full of the death set insignia and the cast spotty camouflage and the tanks things like that, and I I have a real problem with that type of imagery connected with the 12th SS. Of course, we can't ignore their role in the battle. You have to talk about the enemy as you talk about the allies. Of course, you have to talk about both sides. But there's something about the the fanboy is the word that always comes back that I just don't like when you're talking about the 12 Bezos. By all means, study them, understand why they're doing things tactically, and but there's don't revel in it, is I think the, the expression I always say. No, and and 12th SS was not a special division. Um it was oh, yeah, that elite business. Um, yeah. It was not particularly effective. Um in fact, I would say it was particularly ineffective in most battles. Um this battle was not a battle that showed anything they were good at. What it shows is that uh, offensive operations in Normandy are difficult no matter who's undertaking them. And uh, when you have to come out, out of your prepared defenses, cross open ground, um, you're going to probably take very high casualties. And um, what I think it says is not so much about um, how effective the Germans were at their defensive operations, but how effective the Allies were in being able to undertake those offensive operations. Uh, whether it be at um, uh, uh, for the Americans through the Bocage or or uh, the British south of Bayeux or or the Canadians and British on the Falaise Plain, plane. those kind of operations are difficult. Sometimes they went wrong, but more often than not, they went right and were able to crash through those German positions that had all the advantages: advantages of terrain, advantages of firepower, advantages of being dug in. And uh, in spite of that, the Allies were able to push through and win in the Battle of Normandy. And uh, I think yeah. that's uh, an important point. Yeah, the Allies this. certainly came. They, they won more than they lost. And they and they learned quite quickly how to do these things better. And I, I think as well, there's right the early part of this show, people talk about the fact of how open it was. I still think there are people who believe the whole of Normandy is Bocage and Hedros, which, of course, it isn't. Although if you join us on Sunday's show with Gerd van den Bogard about the American Second Division, Near Cerise Le Foray, that is all hedgerows. That is all hedgerows and small fields with big, huge um, embankments and trees behind them. But this, where the Canadians are and the British 50th Division, is very much as we've seen open wheat fields and these slightly undulating fields that, if you happen to be well, in, well, well defended and well dug in and got your fields of fire worked out, they are. They are on last killing grounds, and ki and attacking is is as we said is not easy. So, um, well, I think Mag has done her job now. So, thank you very much. You want to you want to say hello, Mag? I've unmuted you. I think. Hang on. Yeah, hey, hello, Mag. Mag, hello. We see her shadow. Yeah, we can see. We know <laughs> you're there, Mag. We can see your shadow. Hello. Oh, okay. Our image is frozen. I think she's uh, that she can't get in. But we'll, okay, we'll, we'll, okay. Hello, well, Mag. We'll wave. <laughs> Hello, so, everybody. Fantastic Hello, everybody. camera work again. Sorry, I'm interrupting you now. Fantastic camera work, Mag. Well done for the the the, the poppy shots and the maple leaf leaf shot. Yep. Is a new yep. a new yep. signature yep. move there. Yes. <laughs> no, well, well, I hope well, you I hope you enjoy the show. It's a beautiful day out there. No, with, without you, it's just two. It's just two people talking. It's. I know. <laughs> with your images, it makes it something. And thank <laughs> you to Colin for driving here today. We, otherwise, it's just the two of us talking over photos. It's what you're doing live. It makes so much difference to this. So we can't thank you enough. So brilliant. Thank you very much, Mac. Thank yeah, you. nobody wants bye to look bye. at Paul and I. I will see you, you later. Then. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Thanks, Megs. So I think we're kind of done then, Mike. I mean, th th we could go on to the, the next phases of things. And, you know, th that's what happens over the next few days. Philippe, Philippe Bocage doesn't go very well for our lives at the beginning of the day, then goes better than the later part of the day. And that's what happens over the next the rest of June. It's um, good days, bad days. But ultimately, the Allies have more good days than bad days. They replace their vehicles they lose. They replace most of the troops they lose. And everything the Germans lose, they cannot replace. And I think that is definitely worth re reinforcing that idea yeah and the rest of the june rest of june and into early july is, is a stalemate um mark showed the uh uh was it hellfire corner um yeah. where the, the canadians were holding on and it was just nasty nasty being under shell fire and uh mortar fire and not being able to go anywhere it was a lot of patrolling and uh 
really the, the Canadians and the British and, and the Americans to an extent were gathering their breath. They were dealing with the, um, uh, the big storm in the, the channel, which uh, slowed down uh, the reinforcements, uh, didn't cripple them, but certainly made a, a big problem for getting enough uh, ammunition and supplies and fuels uh, where it needed to be. Um, but everybody was building up and, and getting ready. And uh, then in the beginning of July, we've got Charnwood and the, uh, the first steps taken to, to push yeah. to uh, Con and beyond. Yeah, you know, we've, we've got to build our airfields. We've got to we've got to redeploy. We've got to build up all our supplies, and that takes time. I so said we we talked about a couple of days ago. As James Holland always talks about the uh, the restrictions of wealth that the Allies have. We have so much of everything, thankfully, but it t does take time to deploy it. It takes time to bring it across the channel. It takes time to get the aircraft here, to get the supplies here, to get ammunition. And if people are interested in the logistical side of things, if you look up, go on the, on the internet and find out just how many gallons of fuel an infantry division uses in a day and how many gallons of fuel an armored division uses and then how much food and how much material is used every single day and there's nine divisions on june the 6th and we're pretty much landing approximately one a day every day for the next few weeks and the, the army gets huge and it's got to be fed and supported and we've got to get all that artillery there we talk about the massive artillery uh, superiority we have by july well someone's got to unload every single one of those boxes of shells it takes time so june it's often seen as the Allies aren't doing anything. And I think it's they are, they're building. They're building for that breakout. And it's going to take some time, but they've got to build up that arsenal. Um, yeah. Well, and, and I think what Luminol Patrice shows, um, along with the uh, Villar Bocage and the, the British sector, is that these kind of hasty attacks, these kind of um, spearhead attacks, aren't, aren't going to be successful. Um, there was a hope, it was worth trying. Um, but the, the nature of the German defenses was such that. That's not the way that we can mount offensive operations. We needed sort of that big El Alamein type of attack. Uh, yeah. Lots of artillery preparation, bring up everything, uh, shell the hell out of everything, bring in the heavy bombers if we can, yep. and, uh, yep. and uh, spend artillery, not lives. And, it, and it is interesting when we get to totalize and tractable, which we've covered, of course, but previously part of the the success we had is or the allies had is their ability to move forward. But also there's a lot less Germans in front of us. They've they've done operational lutage. They pulled half their divisions out. And suddenly we're finding it, a, 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 the allies are finding it easier to move because there is less of, a, of an enemy ahead of you dug in. And it still takes time. Attacking is still difficult, but it's not quite as difficult as it was in june and um yeah that we, this is what this week is about this attritional aspect of it where day by day the losses are incurring on both sides but gradually gradually the 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 balance of power is shifting in favor of the allies it just doesn't seem like it if you're a medic in the queen's own rifle of canada who have been working in an aid station exactly 77 years ago today right now you wouldn't have been feeling particularly that you were part of the Allied uh, advance and progression in Normandy. You'd been feeling that it had been one of the worst days of your life. And I think that's how I'd like to end this show, is that we have addressed the fact that in the grand scheme of things, this is a development. It's a, it's a, it's a, not a positive day, but it's part of a, of, a, of a strategy that will work. But for those guys who are limping back in knocked at, you know, damaged Sherman tanks and the Queen's Own Rifles guys, it felt very, very different. Yeah, for sure. And, and we can talk about brute force. We can talk about overwhelming material superiority on the Allied side. But when it came down to it, the fight at the, at the sharp end was was very close. It was one on one. There was no big advantages on, on either side. And it often came down to the, the bravery of the individual men uh, going forward. Yeah, the, the Westlake brothers are a great example of that. Yeah, and um, you know you've only got to stand in one of those wheat fields, and you know even with with Mag and Colin driving today, it still takes several minutes to drive from Norion Bessan to the Manila Patry. Then you're doing it at maybe five or ten miles an hour in a Sherman tank sitting on top of it, or if you're walking beside the tank, how long does that take you? How when you start coming out of fire from the north and the south and Nebelwerfers, you know, just absolutely terrifying. So. We're reinforcing the idea that just because June the 6th has been a success, don't think that all these troops have it easy for the next few days. In many ways, it gets tougher and tougher because, as you said earlier, the, the lack of intelligence by the Allies about what was in these villages came back to bite them. Uh, we knew everything about the defences on the beaches, pretty much, and everything that we found was, was, was what we'd already identified. But in these little villages, you go in there underprepared, and this is unfortunately what happens. Yeah. Well, I think we'll bring it to an end, folks. So um, 
uh, I'll, remind, I'll come back and say goodbye to Mike in a minute. I'll just remind you what we've got coming up. So tomorrow night, uh, Robert Pike is coming on talking about Orador Sir Glan. So another rather um, depressing show in a sense. It's about a massacre of French civilians by the SS, but important to understand. The 11th of June, so Sunday, two shows. So uh, early, in, uh, late in the afternoon, uh, Alina Novobilska is joining us to talk about the first transport to Auschwitz. Then later on, Gert van den Bogard, the Belgian who live, a Belgian guy living in Normandy, is talking about the American Second Division in Normandy. So two shows that day. And then Monday, Colin is being the historian for a great show about the 50th Division, the Diamond Light Infantry in Langev. And then um, it starts coming. I've got three days off at the end of next week, which is fantastic. Um, I've got to, we're we're going to just do some other things. It'll be really good. Um, although I love doing this, but it, I, I'm feeling it's a bit non-stop at the moment. But I, I hope you're appreciating it, and I hope you're all enjoying what we're doing, bringing you these incredible historians and these incredible locations. But anyway, right now, it remains for me to say thank you very much to Mike Bechtel for joining us. Your knowledge is excellent. It will work very well as an accompanying show to Mark Milner's show. And, of course, your one last year from Brett Velorgers, Nori, and, um, and Puto. That, it will all work as a nice set. So um, did you enjoy it, Mike, in, 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 the, in the sense of uh, talking about it, not the, not the dwelling in the, de the, the death, but the talking about a battlefield is always fun? Yeah, no, I think this worked really well, and, and thanks again for having me on. It's always uh, my pleasure to uh, to join you and, and talk to your audience. I love reading the uh, the comments. Uh, there's a lot of really knowledgeable people out there, and uh, yeah, it's just been a blast. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. So there we are, folks. I'm going to put the carry on for Mag and Colin later because Colin's coming to dinner tonight because we know we curfew has been extended to 11 p.m. now, so Colin can come around and have curry. So that's we can reward him properly, and there are beers in the fridge, so that will be good. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for everybody for watching. I will see you all again tomorrow for Orador Sir Glan. Great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>